Thank you, Hermione, for that introduction. And it's great to be back with Google Think Travel for 2021. I'm Steve. I'm a partner with McKinsey based in Shenzhen, China. And I'm going to talk to you for the next 20 minutes or so around what's next for travel and the tale of two travel recoveries. Now, globally, we do see lots of evidence of travel demand coming back. Unfortunately, Asia is going to be slower to recover than many. I'm going to take you through some facts on that recovery and talk about the potential implications and what can we in the travel industry be doing. Let's start with some facts. Let's look first at the recovery within Asia. This is a hotels view. We're looking at the RevPAR. Um, and you can see that while China is 100% recovered in terms of the RevPAR versus 2019, other Asian countries lag. And the extent to which they lag depends on how large is the domestic economy. Countries with larger domestic markets, such as India, are performing better than those which were highly reliant on inbound tourism, such as Thailand. Now, McKinsey continues to look at projecting travel recovery, and we do see a lot of latent demand out there. Um, this chart looks at the recovery for air traffic, and we see 2021 in total is likely to be slightly higher than 2020. But this, again, is a very regionally driven story. This is a recovery in US and to some extent European travel. Asian travel outside domestic is still very severely depressed. You'll notice the dotted lines, like every time we do this forecasting, unfortunately, we do get more pessimistic as timelines for opening get pushed back. But there's some reason for optimism, and that's what I want to talk about, about the first economy. Firstly, there's a clear pent up demand here. We see that once travel restrictions come down, leisure demand surges. Um, this chart shows you an example looking at the, um, the UK to the UAE, but we see the same things globally. What is stopping people traveling is not primarily the fear of COVID, it is the travel restrictions in place. And there's a lot of pent up leisure travel demand, which comes back quite quickly once those restrictions are removed. We see the same thing for China as well. Um, we did some recent analysis here looking at the, at the Chinese outbound traveler. China used to be the world's largest outbound market. 150 million Chinese left um, China for leisure trips in 2019. And the good news is, is they all want to come back again. And this is good for Southeast Asian, Japan, Korean tourism. From the survey we did earlier in the year, we actually see a very high number of people wanting to, their next trip to be outbound. So while the borders do remain closed in China and will for some time, we see a lot of pent up demand here and desire and wanderlust to get back on the road. We also note that most consumers have more savings than they've ever had before. During lockdown, most people have not lost their jobs and the ability to spend has decreased. The discretionary spending on leisure travel, restaurant, hotels and poodle parlors and so on has declined. And a lot of that has gone into savings rates. Um, in many cases, we're seeing savings rates being three times or more what they um, what they previously were. Consumers, they indicate that they want to spend this and they want to spend it on travel. Our survey says that the number one thing which consumers want to do post lockdowns is go out and eat in restaurants. The number two thing they want to do is go traveling again. So for, mu for much of the world, especially in US, Europe, we're actually relatively bullish on leisure travel demand. We see lots of, lots of latent demand. We see travel restrictions coming down now with um, higher vaccination rates. Um, and we think that's going to lead to quite a significant travel boom towards the end of this year for those markets. Unfortunately, Asia is another side to this story. This chart shows you the rather bleak picture around COVID deaths. And this is a first, first and foremost, a stark reminder to us that first, that this is a humanitarian crisis. There are still thousands of people dying each day in, across Asia. 
And as you'll see from the charts, this shows you the, which countries, which regions these deaths were in over time. And you can see now the largest segments here, unfortunately, is other Asia. So while many Asian countries were doing a reasonably good job of containing COVID earlier with the Delta variant and relatively lower vaccination levels, it is now Asia which is bearing the brunt of the COVID crisis at the moment. And that's the reason why Asian travel is unfortunately going to be opening up slower than we see for other regions. We have spent time analysing and researching this and we categorise countries into three different archetypes, as you'll see here. The first one are countries with high vaccination rates, but which, which have COVID in their societies. And our view in these is that COVID is going to become endemic. There is reasonable evidence that, especially with the Delta variant, that even vaccinated people can have breakthrough infections. COVID is therefore likely to spread in society. However, the high level of vaccination prevents the worst cases of hospitalisation and deaths. These countries learn to live with COVID and they also therefore learn to live with international travel again. And that's true for the US and most parts of Europe. We have a second type of country, which is um, kind of interesting for us in, in, in travel, which we call the case controllers. This is countries who have a target of zero. We're going to eliminate COVID. But in order to do this, you need to keep in place strong border control and public health measures. China is the leading example. Um, here in China, there was a recent small outbreak. There were strong lockdowns and China has managed to bring domestic cases back to zero again. Other countries have been pursuing this policy, such as Australia and Singapore. However, with recent outbreaks and also higher vaccination levels now, these, companies are, these countries are becoming more comfortable that they, um, with some level of COVID in the societies and we're starting to see some opening up. New Zealand is currently thinking through these challenges at the moment. The third type is what we call at-risk countries, which are those experiencing or at risk of a large COVID wave. Typically, these are have low to moderate levels of immunity through vaccination. Many are developing countries which have had slower vaccine rollouts, and there's limited resources for public health measures. Looking at these visually on the next page, um, we can look at can categorize them into different types. So the high vaccination countries, those who are case controllers, where gradually the immunity level is rising, and those which are at risk, where there are low immunity levels, unfortunately, um, and moderate public health restrictions. We use these archetypes to, to look at how different countries can open up to each other. So what this chart shows you is traveling from on the vertical axis and traveling to on the horizontal axis. And there are some of these where we see limited travel restrictions likely to become the norm in the next few months. That would include, for example, traveling from a, um, from a high vaccination archetype to another country with a high vaccination archetype. In these countries, there is some level of COVID, maybe as some testing is still needed, but these countries have learned to live with a low level of spread within society and therefore they feel free to open to each other. There are others where you see the different directions are likely to have different restrictions. So for example, traveling from New Zealand into Europe, there will be no restrictions. However, the vast majority of travelers are looking to do return trips. And traveling from, for example, the UK into New Zealand will remain with significant restrictions, which is the orange here. That is hotel quarantines, or in some cases, absolute bans on entry. And it's these type B, these case controller archetypes, which are likely to need to hold on to these significant restrictions for some time. The box in the middle of this chart is interesting. This is the travel from countries which are doing case, which are case controller towards other countries which are also case controllers. Earlier on in the pandemic, these were called travel bubbles and there were many initiatives to try and set them up. I think our view by now, unfortunately, we're unlikely to see further inter international travel bubbles. The one successful example we do see set up is between the mainland of China and Macau. And I think there is reasonable expectation that that could be extended to cover mainland China and Hong Kong over the next few months. 
However, we don't see the political appetite anymore for international travel bubbles. And we see many countries choosing to take different approaches. What does this mean in terms of opening up for travel? So we think that with now, so quarter three, quarter four this year, the high vaccination will open up towards a more open set, um, travel with some level of herd immunity and a low case burden in those countries. Case controllers are unfortunately going to remain closed for international travel for some time. China's likely to keep these restrictions in place potentially for, for, for another year. And even then, leisure travel will, will be amongst the last types of travel to come back. Family reunion, business travel will be encouraged before outbound leisure travel. Unfortunately, China therefore is likely to remain closed for some time to come. But lastly, in terms of the at-risk countries, um, the need here is for vaccination campaigns to step up. The good news is vaccine production is increasing, vaccine distribution is extending, and we see 2023 onwards that these countries are likely to start traveling again. So what are the implications for us in the travel industry? The first one, um, everyone's been saying it for the last year, but domestic is still the single most attractive market. And whether you have, have opportunities in this is going to depend on, on, on the country. China, for example, has seen a massive boom in domestic tourism. The money which used to be spent internationally, the 150 million Chinese tourists who used to go outbound, are traveling domestically instead and spending that money domestically. High-end segment in particular, high-end resorts within two to three hours driving distance of tier one cities have, are having their best ever time, with revenues almost double where they had been pre-crisis. The money which used to be spent on weekend shopping trips to Hong Kong or weekend shopping trips to Japan or Korea is being redirected domestically. And that's really helping the Chinese domestic tourism economy. The sorts of things we see um, travel companies doing here, opening up new destinations. The growth is all in leisure travel and not is actually in high-end leisure travel. Opening up new destinations and experiences, especially in the West and also especially for families. We also see increased interest in um, sports trips, educational trips and related activities. Even countries which naturally have a smaller domestic market, still this should be the primary focus. Um, Thailand was heavily reliant on inbound, but also has turned domestic with government incentives as well for domestic tourism. And we've seen the same be true for rediscovering Singapore, for example. This remains our main recommendation for those in Asia. Like domestic is going to continue to be the biggest opportunity for at least the next few months. The travel is increasingly leisure. One thing I didn't talk much about earlier, but which we see happening through this pandemic is that business travel is going to be structurally dented. Our best guess predictions is around 20% of business travel will not return. It'll be replaced by video interactions, and um, virtual meetings. Most business travel will still come back. Like I, for example, can't wait to get back out on the road and meet my clients and meet my teams internationally. But the internal meetings or the flying for a single meeting probably does not come back. Therefore, everyone in the travel industry needs to be thinking about how to innovate products to become more leisure focused. For the airlines, that might be smaller business cabins. It might be, um, premium products more suited to leisure travel, so making sure there are seats together, making sure they are designed for a premium leisure traveler. For hotels, it might be more looking into activities and experiences rather than some of the conventional um, meetings and incentives. Thirdly, we all need to be looking again at how we approach commercials. We can't rely on past data anymore. And for many things such as forecasting or revenue management, this was critically reliant on historical data. If the historical data is now useless, we need to find a new approach to commercial modeling. And we're working with clients looking at using other data signals, so not just historical bookings, but looking at things like, um, things like search volumes, looking at things like look to book ratios and being very dynamic in terms of how to change capacity and pricing. Lastly, 
the restart will come. And when travel restrictions come down, we think it will come back fast. And that's true for Asia as well. I think keeping a very close eye on governments and policy reactions. And when there are announcements that things are going to um, going to release in terms of travel restrictions, being ready to bring capacity back quickly, bringing back the parked aircraft, bringing back mothballed hotels. Travel will boom quickly. People want to get traveling again, and they will once the travel restrictions come down and allow it. For some, ramping up is harder than others. Like in many cases, airlines have furloughed pilots or licenses have expired. Aircraft have been put into long-term storage, taking several months to bring back. And it's going to be very difficult to get the capacity right at the right time and in the right places. For other tourism businesses, such as hotels, unfortunately, many of those have also laid off staff. Other sectors of the economy are actually vibrant and booming. And what we're seeing in developed markets at the moment is that actually many of the leisure travel companies are struggling to bring back the employees needed to handle the travel boom. So. I guess the positive note here, we do think travel is going to return and we all need to be very flexible and ready to bring back the capacity when that does happen. Thank you very much. Um, with that, I'll hand back to the Google team um, who will talk to you more about the breakouts. Thanks again.